Hello, hello. How's it going, guys? All right. Ready to get started tonight. Um, so we are here today to uh, talk about the rise of socialism in Europe. Um, so this is AP European History looking at um, unit number, this is probably like unit number six uh, is when this is going to be covered. Um, so if that gives any bearing for you at all. Um, but we are going to be looking at the rise of socialism. We're going to be looking at the influence that socialism has on Europe kind of throughout the 19th century. We'll dig a little bit into the 20th century, um, but mostly this is going to be talking about kind of how does this play into the industrializing society of Europe? So first of all, I hope everybody's having a really, really good night. I hope everybody is enjoying the end of, of winter um, as we kind of transition into spring. Um, and I know some of you guys have spring break coming up here in just a few weeks. So that's very exciting. I don't, I have spring break in about a month. So we are still far away on this end of the country, but that is a okay. Um, so a uh, few things before we get started today. Um, first and foremost, I want you guys, um, if you have any questions at all, please, please, please make sure you put them in the ask a question tab. I'll be checking that periodically. What I like to do though is with the ask a question tab, that's stuff that I'll hit kind of at the end of the stream. And with this, we should actually should have a few minutes. Normally I'm like rushing to get through, but with this stream, we should have a few minutes at the end. We can go back and we can really take some time and talk about any questions that you guys have. Um, if it's something super pressing, you can throw it in the chat, but for the most part, the ask a question tab is really good for me. Um, because it keeps everything in one place. Uh, but any comments you have, anything you want to make, any comments you want to make, throw them up in the chat. Um, but uh, but but yeah, and anything anything you want me to go a little bit more detail in, um, either put that in the questions, uh, the question tab, or the um, or put that in the chat. Um, but if we're ready to get ready, or if we're ready to go, let's go ahead and jump on in. Um, so let me first start by going over and sharing my screen. The rise of socialism in Europe. We are going to go to presenter view and boom, chakalaka, we're ready to rock. All right, um, so this is the rise of socialism in Europe, AP year in European history. Um, my name is Steven Kuklik. I, for those of you who haven't watched me stream in the past, um, I am a uh, I am a history teacher in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I've been teaching this for four years, um, and this is really this time period in general is one of my favorites to talk about. So I may go on little little tangents here and there as I'm one to do, and that's okay. Um, but this is a really really interesting topic um, because socialism is arguably kind of one of the most important political social economic things that happens in the uh, 19th and 20th century. Um, I mean, obviously this is gonna lay the groundwork for things like the Russian revolution, um, for the spread of communism uh, during the kind of Cold War era, uh, and definitely kind of just generally the foundation of modern governments going forward. Um, which we'll, which we'll all kind of look on, okay? So, um, but this is what we're gonna be focusing on is the rise of socialism. And like I said, I'm not gonna dig into the, uh, I'm not gonna dig into the, um, into the uh, Russian revolution at all. At all. To drop the socials, the social medias, all, this, all the fun social media links here. Um, at Think Five of is pretty much everything to, to, to follow. Um, on Twitter, I know they, they post, anytime there's a stream, day of the post. So if you want to tune in, that's where to, you, if you want to know what to tune into, that's, that's definitely what to, something to follow. Um, then Instagram and YouTube as well. Um, but, uh, that is enough of the pre stuff. Let's go ahead and dive on into it. Um, so what are we going to be covering today? This is kind of the broad overview of what we're looking to cover. So first and foremost, is setting the scene. I want to talk about what does Europe look like at the start of the 1800s and how that's going to impact the, the century. Um, and then we'll just do a general, what is socialism? 
what is socialism um, and then utopian socialism after that. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, this kind of the first real form of socialism that we see in uh, in Europe. And then, of course, Marxism we'll spend some time with and kind of dig into Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels uh, and then communism versus capitalism, uh, socialism, how it spreads throughout Europe. And then we'll do a quick wrap up. So that's what we're going to do. And it's going to kind of be like a chronological order thing. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully it will be a little, make a little bit of sense, but kind of the big issue with the 18, and it's not an issue, but it's just the natural, the way the 1800s works, kind of what I know students really struggle with. And I, and I think for me as a teacher, why I think the 1800s is so cool is because it's a hodgepodge of all of these different ideas and all of these different little tiny things that are happening and all these big things that are happening and all these big themes. And it just can kind of get a little, you know, jumbled and messed up. And uh, for those of you that have been through unit six already and are in unit seven, we're really, it's unit six and seven. Um, you guys know how kind of all over the place unit six is. Uh, I feel like when I'm when I'm teaching Unit Six, I'm I'm go jumping from one thing to the other every single day, and um, I know that can be a real struggle. So I'm gonna kind of try to keep this as chronological as possible, so you can organize a little bit better in your brain. But let's go ahead and dive into. So what is Europe looking like in 1815? So why do I start at 1815? It's the Congress of Vienna. Okay, so the Congress of Vienna is this real big turning point in European history. You know, you, we can kind of lump it in with like the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, it's this really big turning point in European history. We've just gotten past the French Revolution. We've gotten past Napoleon and Europe is now recovering. Okay, they are in hangover state, as I say. They are like, what the heck just happened? All right, you have the French Revolution, which like did a total 180 on what was happening in Europe, right? It was a total super liberal, but also very violent movement in France that spreads to other parts of Europe. I mean, they reject religion for a few years, which is totally out there, okay? And then that ends, and then we get Napoleon, who is this French dictator who declares himself emperor. And he goes through and he pretty much put, puts all of Western and Central Europe under his thumb, and then as quickly as he appears, he disappears, right? I mean, he, Napoleon is like a, a very, very bright firework that burns out quick, okay? And then, you know, I'm not going to get into why because that's not what this stream is about. But 1815, the major European powers, you know, they're taking a step back and they're saying, okay, okay, what the heck just happened? And how do we recover? All right, and with the Congress of Vienna, we know that they want conservatives in power, they want to maintain balance of power, and they want to keep the peace, all right? That is their goals. And that is what Europe really looks like in 1800s, in, the, in 1815. Now, one of the big themes here is keeping the peace. And in fact, this is really the first time in European history we actually have European powers that are saying, all right, let's not try to kill each other. Let's actually use diplomacy and like our words to try to solve problems. Uh, and this is a really pretty radical idea at the time. Uh, and, but I mean, we can't really blame them. They just witnessed Napoleon and they saw the violence of the French Revolution. So we don't really blame them for that too much. Uh, but uh, but this is, this is kind of politically what Europe looks like. But on the kind of other side of things, the economic uh, side of things, we start to see industrialization, all right? Now, industrialization is not really going to spread to continental Europe until the late 1800s, like 1815 past. Um, and so the Industrial Revolution is really going to be kind of localized to, uh, to Britain. The Industrial Revolution is going to kind of be localized to Britain. Um, but Britain is industrializing at this point. And then again, this is not, I'm going to talk a lot about the industrial revolution, but I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, uh, because this isn't an industrial revolution stream. If you have an industrial revolution question though, just go ahead and pop it in chat. That's totally fine. I'll answer it. Uh, but just, I'm not going to get into crazy detail with it here. Uh, but the industrial revolution, it's hitting Britain. 
All right, and we know that the Industrial Revolution, as it starts to creep its way into continental Europe, is going to drastically, drastically change the social landscape of Europe. I mean, the economic landscape for sure, but we're gonna really focus on the social landscape, all right? Specifically, you have people moving from the countryside and moving into cities, because that's where the jobs are. And with that, we are gonna see the development of this brand new class of peoples. Um, conservatives, they are do trying desperately to retain and keep their power. Um, and this is going to be the varying degrees of success. For the most part, we say conservatives do re retain power in Europe. We know the liberal, we know that liberals and we know that um, nationalists are going to attempt to seize that power, again, with varying degrees of success. Um, but we'd say for the most part, conservatives do maintain power. Um, I did a stream two weeks ago that did that was socialism versus conservatism versus nationalism. So go check that out if you want to um, if you want to learn a little bit more about the competing ideologies. Um, and then finally, this last thing here is the middle class. The middle class is gaining, growing wealthier in the early 1800s. Um, not really in size all that much. The middle class is still going to be a small fraction of European society, but they're getting wealthier. I mean, these are the business owners. These are the factory owners. These are the merchants. Um, and so they are, they are, gaining a substantial amount of wealth, but they're not really growing in size. But the working class, this brand new class of people, these are our factory workers, our city workers, they are exploding in population in certain areas, okay? And the working class, unlike the, um, unlike the, the, the peasants that they kind of, um, of that the, the working class kind of pulled from, the working class is gonna face then this brand new set of challenges. And the working class in a lot of ways is gonna be our focus for today, for tonight, I guess, depending on when you're watching this. Okay, so let's talk about socialism. What is socialism? So first and foremost, socialism is a direct response to industrialization and the class inequality that already existed in Europe. So what do I mean by that? Socialism is a response to the fact that you have all of these people moving into the cities, all of these workers working in factories. They are working for a very small wage, dangerous conditions, long hours. And if they complain, if they decide they don't want to work 12 hours a day, guess what? They're fired and we hire the next guy because there is a long line of people that don't have jobs that want them. That's kind of the situation that we're in here, okay? One thing we got to remember is this is a time before labor laws. This is a time before unions. This is a time before um, before the you know minimum wage, all right? And those are all things that are socialist ideas, all right? Um, labor laws, minimum wage. <laughs> unions these are these are things that were implemented in large part because of socialism um now socialists they are going to question these um they're going to question these these existing systems and favored the growing working class all right they are going to take a very hard look at what the heck is happening in um in europe and they're going to say okay how do we address it and how do we fix it um, and so the working class, like I said, this is this new kind of social class. This is this new class of peoples that is, um, sorry, I'm just moving over. There we go. Um, this is this new social class, this new class of people that, uh, that were growing in the industrial revolution. These were the ones that were moving to cities. These are the ones that were kind of, these are kind of like our old peasants, um, moving from the countryside into the city. Now, the big difference here that we need to highlight is that the peasants uh, and, and, and the peasantry in general of, um, of like, you know, old feudal Europe, they were certainly living in poverty and they were certainly living in oppression and all of those things. But the thing is, is that they were at least working, right? And that was the thing is that peasants worked and they, they worked and they tended to at least be able to grow their own food. And so when food, um, when, uh, 
when crops were abundant and, you know, harvests were good, the peasants were eating. And, you know, for, for at least the peasant were peasants were at least for some measure content. The thing is, is that when the working class starts to grow, the working class is not guaranteed to be working. The working class is not guaranteed to be having a meal because the working class isn't actually farming, right? They're not creating the food here. Um, and that's the thing is that the peasants, they at least had a somewhat stable food supply, um, even if it was inconsistent. Uh, it, it was at least a somewhat stable food supply. And the working class, they were kind of at the mercy of the you know, the, the, the shopkeepers and, and, and buying their food as opposed to growing it. Uh, and that is a really, really key difference here. So the working class is going to be much more susceptible to things like unemployment and low wages. Um, and socialists are going to say that the working class, they, they are really, I mean, as the name implies, they are the ones that are working and they are the ones that are, you know, putting in the time and putting in the effort and, um, they want a bigger slice of the industrial pie. They say that the workings workers should have a bigger slice of the industrial pie. This is very like uh, French Revolution third estate, right? There, there where where people are calling you know, the third estate. They are the state, right? They are they are France, and so they need more representation. It's kind of like this for the work at workers, right? Where it's saying you know these these are the ones that are actually working. These are the guys that are making stuff. Why don't they have a bigger piece of the pie here? Uh, and oftentimes they called for a drastic reordering of society to actually achieve this goal. Okay, so early socialists are not going to call for these slow, calculated measures to, um, you know, to change society gradually to help the workers. And that's kind of what is actually going to happen. Okay, so a lot of the social changes that happened in Europe throughout the 1800s that favor the working class are pretty slow and methodical. Um, they're not usually going to be this drastic as a lot of socialists probably want. But the, the thing that is also different here is that socialists are not going to gain favor with liberals or conservatives. And here I need to remind you guys that liberals and conservatives of the 1800s are not, are not liberals and conservatives of 2020. All right, these are not the same people. These are not the same groups. Okay, conservatives in the 1800s, they were our people who supported the old regime policies, monarchies, a connection between the monarchy and the landholder and the church. These are people who favor the old school hereditary monarchies. Liberals, these are really just wealthy middle class bourgeoisie that want representation in government, that want laissez faire capitalist classical economic. Um, classical economic policies in their country, okay? But liberals were not working class and they were not socialists, okay? Conservatives, they favored the monarchy here, okay? So that's one thing when we talk about liberals and we talk about conservatives, we need to remember that these are not the groups of, these are not the liberals and conservatives of today, all right? But because because liberals were this wealth, wealthy working class or these wealthy factory owners, bourgeoisie, socialists were not, they were not fans of socialists. All right. Socialism, socialists were not on their good side because a lot of the policies would directly negatively impact the liberals. So obviously they weren't super jazzed about them. And the conservatives, they really weren't jazzed about anybody. Uh, the conservatives, and then this is the thing we'll talk about as we go through, is that slowly but surely these groups will adapt and adopt socialist ideas as they see fit. But early on, they are not fans of each other. All right, and that's one thing we got. We definitely have to remember here. Let's keep rocking. So <clears throat> let's talk first about utopian socialism. All right, so utopian socialism is kind of the first brand of socialism that develops in the 1800s. Um, this is the idea that society should be based around cooperation, not competition. And when people think about socialism, and especially like things like communism, they tend to think about this idea. And while this, it's not wrong to think about socialism like that, 
we have to remember that this is really just utopian socialism specifically. Um, Marxism and communism are going to draw from utopian socialism, but it's going to be a different type of socialism. All right. And, and we, that's another thing with socialism that we have to remember here is that socialism is a really, really broad thing. It's a broad idea, right? It's pretty much just people saying that we want to question um, society in the 1800s and wonder why the heck um, workers don't have more rights and don't have, aren't making more money and don't have a bigger piece of the pie. Okay. But that's going to look very different depending on who you talk to. And people, I think, especially, um, especially, you know, outside and, and, and in the world and in the news, people tend to kind of lump socialism all together as like this like thing. And we have to remember that socialism is like all the other isms. It's fluid. It's got lots of different faces and lots of different brands. And um, socialism is not just one thing. All right. And that's one thing we, we have to, we have to remember that is that socialism is not all just one thing and that we really shouldn't, when we're, when we're thinking about AP Euro and we're thinking about history, we shouldn't all write it as one thing. Okay. That it's, that it's all that's a it's a it's a general umbrella term for a lot of different stuff here, uh, but utopian socialism is one of those brands, and it's probably the first big brand here. Um, and this is really is a it's a direct response to capitalism, like socialism is in general, um, and it's the idea and 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 along with this cooperation versus competition thing, um, property should be owned by the community, that it should be a a community owned and community driven. Um, thing. Uh, and, and of course, this is going to be named after uh, the book Utopia by Thomas More, uh, in which um, this kind of perfect idealist society is created, um, exists. And um, certainly Thomas More, th this was an idea. Utopia is an idea and a theory, it, or not even really a theory. It's, it's more of an idea um, as opposed to an actual real thing, but it makes sense uh, for this group of people. So they call them utopian socialists. Um, so we're gonna look at a handful of utopian socialists now, going in a little bit of chronological order here, probably our first real utopian socialist and um, maybe arguably the first socialist. This is a guy that's kicking it around in the 1700s, late 17, early 1800s, um, Saint Simon. He's an early utopian socialist, and um, he was he's a really interesting guy. He um, he lost most of his this fortune that he accrues, and he starts he kind of gains this follower this followership um, that and he talks about this idea of like um, all should be awarded based on their ability, um, but that like all people gain give something to society, and because of that, they should be awarded for it. And so this is this is you know not necessarily capitalist, but more of saying like if you're a um, if you're a farmer or you're a worker or you're a business owner or you're a musician or an actor, right? You're contributing in some way to society and the well-being of society. So you should be awarded for that. And this is definitely a response to the kind of the the inequality that existed within like the workplace and within society and the, um, you know, the, the boss versus the employee dynamic, um, where the employee is, is providing a very valuable surface service, just like the bosses. Um, and you know, they, they weren't necessarily being awarded as such. And Charles Foyer is pretty much saying, look, we, we do need to award that. Um, so the, the next person, that we really need to look at here is Charles Foyer, uh, another one of these early utopian socialists here. Um, he kind of takes things a little bit step further, steps further, um, believing in communal housing and pooling resources, believing in individual freedom and a move away from traditional family structure. And this is something you really tend to see a lot with these utopian socialists is this like um, move away from traditional family structure, conservative family structure, um, tending to kind of move more towards like polygamy um, and um, kind of allowing for more expanded sexual partners and more non-traditional families. Um, and all of this was based around the idea that you would um, you would really allow a lot of personal freedom within this um, 
within this uh, this, this kind of shared society. Um, and, and you see, I mean, Saint Simon believed that Charles Foyer believed that. And we'll look at another another person that also believed that. Um, so kind of interesting. Now Charles Foyer does actually attempt to to establish some societies. America, the United States, I should say, the United States is actually a very popular destination for a lot of these early societies. And a big reason for that is because land is really cheap and it's readily available. Um, you know, the United States in the 1800s is not necessarily as crowded as the United States is today. And even today, the United States really isn't that crowded if you look at um, where people live. And so, um, so a lot of, a lot of, because land was so cheap, a lot of, uh, I didn't say a lot, but you know, some utopian socialists attempted to establish living, working utopian societies here. Um, spoiler alert, none of them last very long. Um, and as we're going to see, there are some kind of, um, inherent difficulties with, uh, utopian socialism. Um, but probably the most important, at least I think the most important utopian socialist is Robert Owen. Um, Robert Owen is a uh, business owner, a very successful um, factory owner, who also um, also kind of buys into utopian socialism and the ideas that utopian socialism is based around. And he, um, because he's a factory owner, and not necessarily just a, uh, and not necessarily just a uh, sort of scholar, political theorist, social theorist. He is going to integrate industrialization and socialism, um, and his kind of big uh, his his big grand experiment here is New Lanark, and New Lanark is this uh, this modelist socialist society that he establishes. And out of all of the socialist societies, this is the one that actually like works for when it's around. Um, it's uh, based around a cotton mill. And this cotton mill is kind of like the center of the, the town. And, um, but, but around this cotton mill is a whole entire town. And um, it, it was really a, a, a small settlement that he built around a singular cotton mill. And all the people that work at the cotton mill live in the housing that's provided by the, um, provided by the, by the factory owner. Um, they have good wages um, for the time, very good wages for the time. Um, they provide education for children. Um, they have a lot of off time. So they are working very, very good hours. Um, and they are provided all of these extracurricular activities and just a really generally good life at work and a good life out of work. And um, Robert Owen Instagram integrates this. And what happens is that Profits soar, productivity soars, everybody is super, super jazz, and it really, really works. And this, more than anything else, is an indication that if you keep the worker happy, you as the factory owner are also going to be happy. Um, now, this is not going to like catch on right away and everybody all of a sudden starts um, treating their workers well, but it's more of like something we can turn to to say, hey, this idea actually works. <clears throat> now, Robert Owen is going to try um, is going to try several other ventures that don't really pan out quite as well as New Lanark. But New Lanark kind of becomes this like the prime example of a utopian socialist society that actually kind of functions, um, even if it doesn't have and have the kind of the sustainability. Right? It's it's not in operation today. Um, now, Flora Tristane is our last utopian socialist that we'll talk about. And um, besides being uh, a utopian socialist, she is also part of this early political feminist movement that we see in the 1800s, especially prominent in the 1800s. And um, she is going to argue uh, for, for women's rights, but also more generally speaking for equality of the sexes and um, working rights for both men and women. Um, and she argued that, that the creation of especially things like labor unions would uh, would further benefit the working class more generally. And really kind of her argument and the argument of a lot of, um, of earlier feminists is that if you include women actively into society in all aspects of it, then you're going to see a, a greater, um, you, you're, you're going to see society as a whole benefit and the society um, 
trying to think of the right word here. You, if you integrate this this large population, you know, fifty percent of the population actively into society, society, society improves. Um, I mean, that was the the argument Mary Wollstonecraft makes is that you know you have half of the people in the world um, that are being being repressed and that are forced to stay out of jobs and stay at home and. She argues that if uh, if if women are given the ability to work, society as a whole benefits because that's fifty percent of the population that isn't working. Um, and Flora Tristan is going to kind of argue that same same thing, but in kind of in a more industrialized fashion, specifically looking at the working class here, um, not just women in general. Um, uh, but this is uh, Robert Owen and. Flora Tristan. I had another point that just like came and went out of my mind and it's gone. That's okay though. It may come back, but let's look a little bit out some of what some of these um, utopian socialist societies actually look like here. Uh, mm, I just remember my last point. I'm going to go back real quick. Sorry about that. Um, so Flora Tristan is around during uh, kind of the the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, during a time period when um, when women were traditionally pretty repressed. Uh, the ideas of, of like Rene Descartes, who um, who was very much an, a proponent of the separate spheres idea. That, that women and men should occupy different spheres. That idea was incredibly popular in the early 1800s. And you have Flora Tristain who's really arguing against that. And she kind of finds a voice in, during that time, which is especially, um, especially interesting. Um, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. It would have bothered me if I didn't. Uh, so North, North American phalanx, uh, this is one of, the, um, one of these failed uh, utopian socialist societies, and we can actually see some of the remnants there on the left and what it was ideally supposed to look like in the top right there. Again, this was in America. Land was cheap. They bought up cheap land and established the society, and it doesn't really work. Unfortunately, the um, the main building burned down in the 1970s, so it's not around anymore, which is kind of a shame. I always think these these society, these 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 old structures of these failed societies are super super interesting. But of course, New Lanark, which New Lanark is still in existence today in terms of the buildings. Um, I think a historical society operates out of there now, um, giving tours, which is which is super cool. Um, but it was also this very idealist society like we talked about. Um, and what I love about all of these societies, we can look at the, the, the North American phalanx as well, um, is that they were very much inspired by this like grand idea of, of humanity, but also of nature and of the connection between man and nature and the natural well-being and the natural state. Uh, you know, very much inspired by enlightenment ideas of like man and nature, uh, but also really heavily inspired by the romantic romanticism and the romantic ideas of the 1800s of, you know, nature being this like, this wild, beautiful thing, and and men, man just existing within it, um, and I think that's kind of captured in the way that these societies are really portrayed. Right, we can see the North Amer American phalanx here, how that's portrayed, and then also with um, with New Lanark, this idealist, romantic society um, that exists within nature, um, not necessarily trying to control it; they just exist with within it. Um, which is a you know very much an idea of romanticism, um, but that's for another time. All right, let's talk about Marx. So Karl Marx, uh, the the probably the most infamous, famous, whatever whatever word you want to deem fits Karl Marx of socialism in the 1800s. I mean, this guy is iconic um, when it comes to social theory. And rightfully so. I mean, he is the, there's a reason we're still talking about him today. And uh, there's a reason why he is in his face and, and his look is so iconic is because he really is probably the most important 
socialist that existed in the 1800s. Um, his ideas expressed in the Communist Manifesto are going to literally change the world. Um, and of course, he writes this with Frederick Engels, and it's really, you know, Frederick Engels really gets the short end of the stick. I mean, he's, he's, um, he, he's really, you know, he's one of these guys in history that like he's overshadowed by his coworker, um, which is, which is, which is quite a shame. But, um, but Karl Marx was definitely the, the, the more radical, and I'm not necessarily the more radical, but the more actively involved of the two, and he was definitely the face of the operation. But regardless, Karl Marx writes the Communist Manifesto. It's published in 1848, which I love. And there's, you know, there, there's no mistake of that it's published in the same year that we see these mass revolutions that spread throughout Europe. Um, and certainly, I'm sure they were thinking about the ideas of the Communist Manifesto while they were observing all this happening. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what these base ideas were that were expressed within the Communist Manifesto, and then we'll talk about how that actually interacts with society. So Karl Marx, he, he kind of, it, and the Communist Manifesto is really straight to the point. And he, he lays, Marx and Engels, they lay out kind of just like this bang, bang, bang. These are the things that are true, and these are the things that are happening because these truths exist. <clears throat> and Marx says that history forever has been about class struggle. History is just constant class struggle. That's what it is. And he says that um, that society is, is it struggles between the haves and the haves and the have nots, those that have and those that don't have. And he goes on to explain that in 1848, the haves are the bourgeoisie, and the have-nots are the proletariat or the working class, and he uses these words very, um, you know, very purposely: bourgeoisie and proletariat. We know that the bourgeoisie. I mean, this is a term that's been around for a while at this point to describe the uh, liberal, wealthy class of France in the build-up to the revolution. Um, but now, Marx has vilified them in a lot of ways, explaining how they were the ones that were taking advantage of the working class. Um, but eventually what would happen is that the, the working class would rise up against the, um, the tyranny of the bourgeoisie and overthrow them and establish this new communist society. Um, but one thing we need to say here is that when this is released, Marx becomes one socialist voice but is not the most prominent necessarily at the time that this is released. Okay. Marx is one in, you know, several dozen very important socialist voices. Now he is going to be actively involved in socialism. And he's going to be acti actively involved in a lot of these efforts to establish socialist policy and communist um, societies. But, um, but he's, he's one in, you know, one in a dozen. Uh, but he will be, be he will become probably the or his idea will become communism would become the most important socialist idea even by the end of the 1800s um, one of the most important socialist ideas now Marx will go on to explain that communism is a response to capitalism um, capitalists exploit the working class um, and they take advantage of the proletariat and uh, because capitalism inherently relies upon competition within cap between capitalists, they would kill themselves off. And the number of capitalists would reduce because of competition, while the number of working workers would inevitably rise because of competition between capitalists. And when this happens, eventually the workers will drastically outnumber the capitalists and they will rebel against the capitalists to establish a classless society. Um, and this is, you know, the famous line as, um, is, um, workers of the war are, are, um, uh, workers have nothing, nothing to lose, but their chains, their chains, workers of the world unite. Uh, it's this, you know, this idea that there, there's nothing to lose here. You're already imprisoned. Um, now Marx, the, the key thing here is, is that Marx doesn't really go on to explain what this communist society is actually going to look like. 
All right. He he just explains that it's classless and cooperative, very similar a lot similar to like our utopian societies. And this is where we run into problems: is that when people start to imp- try to implement this thing, they're going to realize that it it's there's no blueprint, right? There's no plan. Lenin's going to run into this, and he tries to establish it in Russia. Um, to the point to where he's like actually adopting some ca- capitalist uh, policies because he's like, look, we need to do something. Um, but Mark, Marx is really just kind of like, they, these are the causes and these are the effects. And this is, you know, sort of what society will look like. But these are the causes and these are the effects. I mean, he's almost like trying to predict the future here because he's very confident in the fact that eventually there will be a proletariat revolution, a communist revolution. It's just a matter of time. And Marx actually believes pretty pretty heavily that it's going to start in Britain, which, like, let's think about it. It kind of kind of makes a lot of sense that it would start in Britain. Um, that's where industrialization had started and where it was its most prominent. I mean, Britain is the most industrialized city in Europe for a long time, and so uh, it makes sense that you know the, the heart of industrialization is um, is is where this communist revolution will begin. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Marxism in action here. Um, so if we think about socialism as a reaction to capitalism, as I've said this whole time, um, we, we can kind of see how they actually utilize that. They utilize their socialist ideas and how they actually attempt to change society. And so we're going to look now a little bit at how socialism spreads throughout the European continent. So first, we'll start start with the first international and the second international. The first international is actually created with the help of Karl Marx. So Marx is actively involved in attempting to spread communism. Um, Not the second international, though, um, only the first. Uh, But regardless, these were uh, kind of these these grand efforts to help workers unionize, help them get politically involved. they were like kind of almost like these, we can kind of think about them as like these big conventions of attempting to get the workers involved. Um, and uh, it was, it was, it was, you know, this one, it, it was one step in several steps that moves us towards a more labor conscious um, society. Um, the Fabian society is an, another example of this, um, a British intellectual um, uh, Beatrice Webb who, who is part of this movement of, of what we're going to kind of call social Democrats, socialist Democrats, who argue that it is more effective to adopt socialist policies through um, existing systems and not revolution. So through politics, not through revolution. So she is going to definitely be on a different spectrum than Karl Marx, who who is all for revolution, as well as other um socialist but but she she is what we would call a social democrat um she, and she's not the only one and we know that i mean that's how really socialism is going to spread is it's through existing political systems <clears throat> uh now labor unions are going to be a a pretty big result of socialism here and they developed throughout the 1800s and really i mean they were just uh, a, a coalition of workers who realized that through collective action that they could actually get things done, that you know, they outnumber the factory owner. And so really they hold a substantial amount of power here. And uh, labor unions were kind of this evolution of like an old school medieval guild system um, where guilds were typically limited to skilled workers, but labor unions are going to encompass skilled and unskilled workers, uh, specifically unskilled workers though. And so by the 1880s, you see unskilled workers starting to unionize and striking became a very common way that workers had their voices heard. And, you know, there's been some pretty infamous strikes throughout or infamous, famous, whichever way you want to look at it, strikes throughout history, Um, especially in the United States. The United States has its fair share of strikes. Um, And eventually these unions are going to lead to the creation of these new uh, parties in um, in different countries. In Britain, for example, it's the Labour Party. Um, and typically these parties are going to adopt more socialist ideas. These are going to start to be our socialist parties and the ones that actually start to see some level of success in passing um, more socialist-minded policies. Um, so in Germany, 
you have uh, socialism probably taking its biggest step forward. Uh, socialism, socialism is incredibly popular in Germany. Uh, I mean, Germany, when it's, when it's created in 1871, it becomes the most industrialized overnight, the most industrialized country on the continent. Um, so not including Britain, the most industrialized country on the continent, uh, incredibly large working class. And so, yeah, socialism is really popular there. Uh, but it's also a response to the, to the fact that Germany was an incredibly conservative society. I mean, that's the way that Otto von Bismarck really set it up when he created Germany. Um, not to say that Bismarck is the only reason that Germany was created, but I mean, it kind of is. Uh, but the, the Socialist Democratic Party, or the SPD, because that is German, SPD becomes the most popular socialist party in Europe. The SPD is kicking it, you know, heavily in Germany. They are crushing it there. People love the SPD, and they are going to, um, to become a very prominent political party. Um, and if you look around at, at European countries today, a lot of these parties are still existing. Um, the Labour Party, the SPD, um, they might have evolved some, but they're they're still there. So talking more about that British Labour Labour Party, um, and it was um, it was really a place where where you could have uh, people arguing for the rights of workers, and you do see. In a very British typical fashion, they slowly but surely adopt a lot of these policies, and that's kind of the 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 growing. The growing is not the right word. The that's kind of the history of Britain, is that Britain will slowly but surely adopt policies to avoid revolution. I mean, they do it with um, they they do it when they they avoid the French Revolution, they avoid the eighteen forty eight revolutions. Um, they adopt policies slowly but surely. It's what Britain does. They're good at it. And um, they do the same thing here. By 1906, accident, sickness, old age, and unemployment insurance was established. Um, they increased the taxes on wealthy British citizens to pay for this insurance. Um, and when the House of Lords, and this is one of my favorite parts of, of British history, is the House of Lords. Um, they they reject this. They say, um, they say, no, you can't, you can't do this. And the House of Commons is just like, okay, well, you can't do anything anymore. We're going to strip all your power, um, which is which is really, which is really, I mean, it's a it's a pretty interesting part of British history. Um, and if you um, if you go and you and you look at the uh, the it's even today the the British Parliament, I mean, the House of Commons has all the power. the 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 House of Lords it, it still exists, but it really doesn't do all that much. The House of Lords. Um, really is just there to as, as a symbolic thing, much in the same way of the, um, the queen. So wrapping up, and I know we kind of, we talked a lot a lot, but I tried to kind of make it a logical arc. Um, socialism was a reaction to capitalism through and through. It was particularly popular with the working class. They are going to be the ones that are most susceptible to um, to socialist ideas, which you know should make a lot of sense. Um, the uh, socialist ideas were slowly adopted by most countries. Um, kind of talking more about Germany, Bismarck is actually going to slowly adopt socialist parties in an effort to curb socialist revolution in Europe and Germany. Um, so radical socialist activities was was present in most countries. Um, although it is going to not really, um, it is not going to really manifest itself um, any, in anywhere, but I should say manifest itself with any sort of great effect in anywhere but Russia. I mean, Russia, of course, is going to see the establishment of a communist government, um, while other countries mostly are able to avoid socialist um, any sort of successful socialist revolution. And Marxism and communism will have the biggest impact on Europe in the 19th and 20th century. Um, Marxism and communism, in terms of socialism, they are going to be the biggest impacts here. And when we're thinking about socialism, and this is going to be kind of one of the last things I say, is that we, we remember that this is, this is people questioning society and industrial society and wondering 
why are workers who are this integral part of the process here, why aren't they given more rights? Why aren't they giving a bigger piece of the pie? I mean, this is the same thing we have seen time and time again in history, in, in European history. I mean, same thing happened with the third estate, questioning why did the first two estates have way more rights than we do? We see this all the time. And this is just another one of these reactions. And in a lot of ways, you know, this was, this is the same point that Marx is making is that history is just constant struggle between the haves and the have nots. Um, one, another thing, a few things, actually, I, you know, I lied saying that was the last thing I, I, I was going to say. I've got a few more things to say and then I'll be done here. Um, one reason why Marx is so popular is because um, Marx really frames his ideas in a very sort of like economic, factual way that utopian socialists just simply weren't. Utopian socialists were very like, these are our ideas and this is like theoretically and like all this stuff. And, and, and Marx is very much like, this is the truths. These are, you know, this is X and this is Y. He's very, he's very kind of like, he almost, it's almost like a math equation, the way he sets it up. And that's really, really popular with a lot of people because it is very black and white. There, there's no room for like, yes, buts. There's no room for like alternatives. Like he sets it up with X and Y and this is it, black and white. Um, and so, and so that is why Marx is very appealing and why communism becomes so appealing. Um, and, um, and then finally, last thing I'll say is, is when thinking about why communism rubs up with capitalism, um, we have to think about capitalism and, and how inherently it's not going to favor the worker, especially this la laissez-faire classical economics capitalism. Um, and Adam Smith, I mean, he actually talks a little bit about, um, about workers and workers' rights and wealth of nations, his, his book that outlines capitalism. And he says, you know, inevitably the worker will gain rights because of this competition. And he really didn't have much to go on with that. I mean, Adam Smith is writing a lot of this theoretical stuff in the same way um, about capitalism in the same way that Marx is writing theoretical stuff about communism, right? Neither had either had had any real history to go off of when thinking about both of those ideas. Um, and they were just kind of like guessing that would happen. And, and, and Marx is going to respond to Smith very kind of point blank and says, look, you are wrong capitalism is not good for workers. And in fact, it made their lives worse because of competition. Um, and so that is another just kind of interesting thing. And something good to think about is, is, is when you, when you think about communism, think about classical economics, capitalism, and how it's a direct response to that and the stuff that capitalism really got wrong and the things that Adam Smith got wrong. Okay. So that's socialism in a nutshell. Like I said, this is an idea that's going to be around for a very long time, and communism will be the most one of the most important ideologies of the 19th, 20th, and even 21st century. Um, so there's a few minutes less left. If you guys have any questions, um, throw them in the Ask a Question tab. Um, if not, um, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you guys don't have any questions, thanks so much for tuning in, um, and I will um, I'll see you guys all next time.